Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of you. Uh, this is our first 222 meeting for our seminar of AIR, the Atelier Interdisciplinaire de Recherche sur l'Environnement, the Interdisciplinary Research Workshop on the Environment, where we develop and discuss environmental climate and ecological transition research in Sciences Po. This program is run by at the initiative of the Direction Scientifique de Sciences Po. Today, we're going to discuss the politics and policies of carbon neutrality in Japan. Uh, when climate and energy policies in Japan are considered, what immediately comes to our mind is the terrible Fukushima accident of 2011 and its consequences. One of its noticeable aftermath was the hostility of the Japanese population to nuclear power, the shutdown of a number of nuclear reactors, the decline of nuclear in the energy mix and the return of fossil fuels with a more carbon oriented and dependent to foreign sources of energy situation for the country with oil and gas, mostly gas export, import from Russia, Australia, Southeast Asia. As a result, Japan has been slow or slower to implement its commitments to CO2 emission reductions. However, relatively ambitious targets, targets have been announced by the government in preparation for the COP26 in Glasgow at the end of 2021. So can these objectives be achieved? Which in a, with which energy mix? Will this come with a large deployment of renewable energy as uh, Yoshihide Suga, the prime minister in 2020 to 2021 claimed for, or with a return of nuclear and to nuclear power as, as his successor Fumio Kishida seemed to suggest. These are some of the issues we're going to discuss uh, today. We are very glad to host uh, Professor Toshi Arimura. Um, Toshi Arimura is Professor of Political Science and Economics and Director of the Research Institute for Environment, Economics and Management at Waseda University in Tokyo. Waseda University is one of the major partner of Sciences Po in East Asia and worldwide. Professor Arimura has served on a number of Japanese government committees on environmental issues. He also sits on the editorial boards of a number of academic journals, such as the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy or Environmental Economics and Policy Studies. He was also awarded a number of uh, distinction for his uh, research and publication. This presentation will be discussed by Caroline Postelvinet. Uh, Caroline Postelvinet is a research director at the CERI, the Centre, Centre for International Research at Sciences Po. And we also have together with us, uh, Caroline, I should mention, is one of our most uh, qualified experts on Japan and East Asia more generally. She's a political scientist. And Patrick Kriki. Uh, he's an emeritus uh, research professor at CNRS at uh, Gael uh, Research Center based in uh, Grenoble, uh, Applied Economics to the Environment with the University of Grenoble Alpes. Uh, Patrick Kriki is also a very renowned uh, scholar and expert advising the French government and uh, publishing a lot in this area of climate uh, policy and energy transition. So we're looking forward to this uh, session. Now, Professor uh, Arimori, Arimura uh, will speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll listen to the questions by the discussants and op open the floor to the, to the audience. Professor Arimura, the floor is yours and Ministry of the Environment, MOE. So here I am uh, showing some uh, figures that we see Ministry of the Environment or NGOs or financial sector on the left-hand side. They are close to the low carbon society or carbon pricing. But the on the right-hand side, you see the uh, METI and the Japanese Federation and energy intensive sectors. 
And I, I have been participating in the uh, climate policy discussion since 2009. And in 2020, before the earthquake, we had a Democratic Party of Japan in the cabinet. And they proposed carbon tax and emission trading schemes and feed-in tariff, uh, all of three are together. And the, the main attention was actually emission trading schemes. You know, I mean, this was the influence of European EU ETS system. EU has this uh, grand design of policy since 2005. So we also discussed emission trading schemes. And, but the, and I was involved in the discussion on the Ministry of the Environment. But the METI also has its own uh, committees to discuss uh, carb, uh, emission trading schemes. And we faced the opposition from the Japanese uh, industries. And I was invited to uh, a parliament to talk about how we can deal with this uh, competitiveness concerns from the industries. Uh, but my voice was not heard. <laughs> And we had uh, actually 18 public meetings on the Ministry of the Environment. And each meeting lasted like a two or three hours and open to the public. We are exposed to media, uh, but we faced the strong oppositions and skepticism uh, against the emission trading schemes. And so actually the Ministry of the Environment wanted to uh, introduce ETS, but the Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industries committee was against ETS. And finally, the government failed to introduce ETS at the national level. So that was what happened in 2010. And surprisingly, all of a sudden, they decided to introduce carbon tax, which was not discussed in the public. <laughs> But during the turmoil after the earthquake, they all of a sudden announced that we will introduce carbon tax. So, but the emission, discussion on the emission trading scheme actually was also uh, done by the Ministry of uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government. So I would like to share with you some tension or between the Tokyo government and national government. <laughs> national, Tokyo metropolitan government actually tended to be a front runner of environmental policies. Uh, I mean, you can imagine that in the big cities have been suffering from air pollution in 1960s, 70s. So they had to deal with all these issues. And in around 2000, 20 years ago, we had a Governor Shintaro Ishihara, he's a kind of a right-wing motivated politician, but very also a, support, a good supporter of uh, environmental policy because he was a, a environmental minister when he was a, a parliament member. And yeah, he, and I think he wanted to place Tokyo as like a California in the US. And we had the issue of uh, particulated matters uh, PM10, you know, this is exhaust gas from the automobiles uh, and Tokyo government and the neighborhood states uh, mandated the installation of this diesel particulate filters, DPF. And they successfully uh, actually reduced uh, PM10. And he, this is the uh, governor Ishihara. Yeah, he made a big uh, press conference that the air of Tokyo is dirty, is filled with this uh, PM10. So we had, I have to clean up the air of Tokyo and there was a big sensation and it was very successful. And, and I wrote about this policy in my book on evaluation of Japanese environmental uh, regulation. So yeah, if you have this in the library, you can check it. <laughs> well, if your university subscribed Springer, you can read it free. <laughs> okay. So when they worked on this air pollution issues, to this, in the neighboring uh, states, Saitama, Chiba, and Kanagawa, three neighbors joined 
this effort of reducing air pollution. So this has been a successful uh, cooperation among neighboring states. So Tokyo is in this part and Saitama, Kanagawa, Chiba in, uh, in this area. Okay. And what about carbon pricing? So after the success of this uh, air pollution regulation, Tokyo wanted to have ETS together with neighboring states. But this time only Saitama joined this movement. So we have ETS in Tokyo and Saitama only, but Chiba and Kanagawa did not join the emission trading schemes. Uh, and I believe that this is because Chiba and Kanagawa are facing the Tokyo Bay and they have a big power plants and big steel mills. So energy intensive sectors in these states, I think were against the introduction of uh, regional uh, policies, you know. So only site, I'm sorry, I was in the wrong slide. It's only Saitama, Tokyo had ETS, uh, having ETS and no ETS in these two states and because big power plants and steel plants are in this area. And uh, last year, I published a book uh, called Carbon Pricing in Japan. And this is actually an open access book. So you, you can download it free. Uh, if you Google it, uh, you can find it easily. And uh, so Tokyo ETS is a unique, in the sense that the target was commercial uh, and service sectors. So this was the first ETS targeted for the uh, commercial sectors. And uh, Saitama ETS is a, a unique ETS in the sense that it has, they face no uh, penalty for violating from uh, emission trading schemes. But Japanese uh, manu manufacturers in Saitama Prefecture are still cooperating uh, under this emission trading schemes. And in this book, I examined uh, the impact of emission trading scheme. So this is my uh, kind of typical research. And you know, people criticize that ETS doesn't work. You know, if you look at the history of European uh, EU ETS, I mean, the price of permits has been very low after the financial crisis. So people were kind of skeptical about ETS. And in the case of Japan, after the introduction of Tokyo ETS, we've had, uh, we faced earthquake, big earthquake, and that led to the shutdown of nuclear power plants as uh, Professor Baldwin mentioned. And that led to the in, uh, import of uh, natural gas, expensive natural gas, which led to the power price increase by 12% uh, in three years. So some people argue that emission reduced was reduced because of this power price increase. So in this book uh, research, we examine the impact of electricity power price increase which was found to like a 62.5% reductions, but ETS itself contributed to the 6.8% reductions. And actually the university, like Waseda University uh, also under Tokyo ETS. And by looking at the uh, data from university all over Japan, we found that emission trading schemes uh, contributed 4% reductions in the uh, under Tokyo ETS. And we also examined the impacts on the manufacturing sectors. And we found that uh, more than 10% uh, uh, reduction of the demand of uh, electricity. So Tokyo ETS worked. And we also examined the Saitama ETS, the neighbor of Tokyo uh, in chapter seven, which was done by Professor Hamamoto. And so despite the uh, you know, argument of the dried towel by uh, Japanese Business Federation, actually the Tokyo was able to reduce emissions 
And this is what happened after uh, the earthquake. So actually you can see that uh, compared to the baseline year, uh, Tokyo ETS reduced carbon emission by 27% from 2010 to 2008. So it has been a very successful uh, emission uh, trading schemes. But interestingly enough, uh, only 20% of, of the uh, facilities are using uh, trading emission trading schemes. 80% of the facilities reduced uh, the, uh, the emissions by themselves. So trade is actually limited. So that's a kind of the feature of uh, this total emission trading schemes. And yeah, since because we have been, uh, the, the experience of Tokyo and Saitama are so successful, I am proposing that maybe we should expand the system to the rest of the Japan, but the national governments, uh, bureaucrats are not accepting my uh, idea, <laughs> unfortunately. And so this is the uh, transition of uh, permit price uh, under Tokyo ETS. Uh, so emission permits actually started like around uh, $100. So it's like a 90 euros per ton, but it dropped sharply because you know, they successfully reduced the emissions. So it's now like four or five euros per ton. So now it's much, much lower than the uh, price under EU ETS. But the credits from renewable projects has been relatively high. The credits from renewable uh, energies actually can be used for other uh, purposes. So there is a demand for renew uh, credits from uh, renewable energies. And Tokyo Metropolitan Government is still, I mean, it's always trying to beat the national government. So before the announcement by the national government in 2019, the governor Koike, who loves Paris, <laughs> she was very, uh, yeah, she, she worked hard to host the Tokyo Olympics. And she was very proud that the next uh, host of the Olympics is Paris. And she, yeah, she, yeah, she announced that the Tokyo will achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. But this was done in 2019 before the national government committed to the carbon neutrality. And in 2021, Governor Koike announced carbon <clears throat> half. She always used the English word to <laughs> uh, clay uh, her uh, policy. So she, Tokyo is now trying to achieve the 50% reduction by 2030. So which is a very big target. And I am actually sitting in the uh, environmental council of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. So in the last few months, I've been having so many conferences, meeting with Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is kind of the picture that they are showing us. So this blue line is the energy consumption in Tokyo area. So this has been uh, sharply decreasing over time. And now they are, we are trying to achieve 50% reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. But you can see that uh, carbon emission is not declining uh, together with energy consumptions because uh, carbon intensities from power sector has sharply increased after the earthquake because of the shutdown of nuclear. But after the 2013, CO2 emission has been also decreasing. Uh, so the, the power sector, actually the, the power sector is a very important, uh, very powerful uh, sec business sector in Japan in terms of the energy policy. So they have been opposing to like a emission trading schemes for many years. 
and the we had uh, nine uh, regional monopoly companies operating all over Japan. I mean, so we had separated uh, markets, and each company has a very strong power uh, for the in each market, and they were very politically vocal and politically strong uh, to stop the aggressive climate policy or even the deregulation of the power markets. And there was a deregulation of the uh, big manufacturers, customers in 2004, but there was not much competition after a while. And, you know, we have the, our grid is limited and we have a rich solar energy in the Southern Island and very strong wind uh, on the Northern Island. But there are some problems that we have is that in the Eastern part of Japan, we have a 50 Hertz uh, frequency, but in the Western part, we have 60 Hertz frequency. So there's a limited connection between these uh, two parts of Japan. And also we have very limited grid connections in between these two islands, uh, with Northern Island and Main Island, and Southern Island and uh, Main Island. So we can we have not been able to utilize our renewable energy uh, compared to that potential. And so one discussion is that we should invest in this grid. Uh, in between islands, between islands and between the two parts of Japan. And after the earthquake, there was a big change in this policy in the power sectors. So after the earthquake, uh, as you can imagine that people criticize the power sector, especially Tokyo Power Company for not taking care of the, uh, this risk of uh, tsunami. So they lost, I think, the political power and the government introduced a feed-in tariff to promote renewable energies. And also uh, government decided to deregulate the market uh, and unbundling the uh, transmission and the distribution and power uh, generations. So they established uh, OCCTO so this is the organization for cross-regional coordination of transmission operators, which is in charge of the, all the transmission now. And the retail market of the power has, was deregulated in 2016. And it was only this time that the power companies started to compete each other. Until uh, 2016, I know we didn't see much competition even though the markets for the big customer was were deregulated and legal unbundling was achieved in the last year. And the power sector has been I mean, changing over years and other part of the business sectors has been changing, especially after the 2015, I think. In the first thing, there was a Paris Agreement which had a big impact on the Jap uh, Japanese discussion on climate policies. And also we see that big role of ESG investment. I think this is a impact of the European financial sectors. Uh, they promoted uh, ESG investment, environment, society, government. And this has becoming a big moment for Japan. And also TCFD, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Now, many com any companies, um, many companies that are getting you know, financial resources now have to disclose their risk and opportunities related to climate. So even without government policies, this has been the climate uh, action toward climate uh, has been like a, in the many companies are facing big pressures to something, to do something on climate. The other thing is that just like in Europe, uh, 
uh, we are having uh, lots of extreme weather events. And this is a very strange or very shocking picture. This is the Brit plain under the rain. Actually, this was uh, stored in the mountain areas or Nagano area in Japan. And nobody expected that they have like a flood in that region. But because of the heavy rain, we had a big uh, flood and actually all these trains are damaged and, uh, and it was like a big loss for the company. And then IPCC's 1.5 special report. So what I see now is that financial sectors are moving to the very left and the Japanese Business Federation also moving and even the METI is a moving toward low carbon society and carbon neutrality. So we see a big shift. Well, at least I, I, I see a big shift. And we still see some in energy in sector are still on this side, <laughs> especially maybe the steel sector. <laughs> Let's see. So this chart, uh, this figure is showing how Japanese emissions is, has been changing over time. Uh, so actually after 2013, Japanese emission has been uh, decreasing over time. And in 2016, the prime minister Abe announced 80% reduction by 2050. And in 2000, 20, uh, Prime Minister Suga announced carbon neutrality, zero emissions uh, by 2050. But uh, he even made a big announcement, strong announcement uh, in facing the climate summit in the last April, he announced a 46% reduction by 2030. So this is actually, actually is a very big surprise. I mean, Japanese industries and the government have been contemplating and discussing how to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, but nobody thought about reduce emission by 46% by 2030. So this was a big surprise to the industry and even to the government. And another interesting is that, so this is 46% reduction by national government. Tokyo must go over it, right? So Tokyo aim 50% reduction. <laughs> Slightly bigger than 46. And, but the, when they announce the carbon neutrality, they don't mean that, uh, the government does not mean that uh, the, we emit no, emissions. I think in the 2050, we still have some emissions remain. <coughs> Sorry. Especially from uh, steel sectors and cement, they will uh, still remain. But we uh, actually assumed a sink or sequestration and removal <coughs> using some <coughs> new technologies. <coughs> And so after, before the announcement of 46% reduction, so this is how uh, the, this, this uh, bar shows electric power uh, sectors, how they supply the, each sources. And 2019, 18% 18 of electric power come from renewables and 6% from nuclear. Remember, we used to have 30% uh, covered by nuclear. We now only have 6% and 37% and from LNG. So this, this has become much bigger than before the earthquake. And we still use 32% of coal. It's a still big share. And when the government announced uh, carbon neutrality, their emission tar uh, their target for the 2030 was uh, 
this bar in the middle, so 23% of renewables in 2030. And the nuclear 21% by 2030. But after the 46% reduction target into uh, last year, the government uh, scaled up the share of renewable to 37%. And yeah, and the share of coal and oil energy has become smaller. And in addition, you can see that they are expecting to have some hydrogen and ammonia generation by 2030, you know, by 1%. And another thing that uh, I want to mention is that among the renewables, you know, we expanded the share of renewables by feeding tariff, but most of the expansion came from solar so far. But now we are trying to increase uh, using uh, wind powers and some geothermal and biomass. So after this kind of changes, uh, we also discussing a carbon pricing in Japan. Actually, after the earthquake, uh, no one has discussed uh, earthquake until Paris Agreement. <laughs> and Paris Agreement uh, revived the discussion of carbon pricing under the Ministry of the uh, Environment. But the and Ministry of the Economy and Trade and Industry finally started to discuss uh, carbon pricing after the announcement of carbon neutrality by uh, Prime Minister Suga. And but as, as I will show that the two ministries are uh, following two different uh, paths. Uh, one is uh, voluntary carbon markets under METI and uh, Ministry of the Environment is promoting environmental tax. And in addition to this carbon pricing discuss uh, question, we have a uh, low carbon policy on power sectors. Uh, we have interesting scheme called non-fossil fuel certificates. So the power company must have certain share of powers come from non-fossil fuel. Meaning that they either must have renewables or nuclear. So this is a policy actually to support nuclear. And another thing is that uh, we are, the Japanese government have been implementing Energy Saving Act, which uh, promote lots of energy efficiency at the manufacturing facilities or service sector or power plants. And using this scheme, the government is trying to close down the inefficient coal power plants. So that's another policy piece. And here is the uh, current carbon tax in Japan. So actually after the oil shock uh, in 1970s, Japanese government introduced petroleum and coal tax, which is 700, it's around seven euros for oil and 3.5 euros for oil energy and 2.5 euros for coal. And on top of these coal, uh, petroleum and coal tax, the government introduced carbon tax uh, in 2012, 289 yen per ton of CO2. So it's like uh, 2.5 euros, very small. And the Ministry of the Environment is now discussing to increase new, uh, to add new carbon tax. So first they want to uh, equate this effective carbon rate so that uh, per ton of tax becomes equal across different fossil fuel. You know, current system is kind of favoring coal. And on top of that, they want to expand more carbon tax uniformly for all three fuel type. 
Oh, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I forgot to mention that this tax is charged when the Japan imports coal, LNG, and oil. Most of the energy, fossil fuel, we import from overseas. And this tax revenue, it goes to special accounts. So it's used for the energy efficiency and the renewables. And recently, I think they are trying to use it for the promote batteries or hydrogen and CCUS. And this figure shows how the current carbon tax revenue uh, changed over years. So, well, the car carbon tax was introduced in 2000, uh, I think, uh, 11, I forgot. And initially they started at the low rate. So it increased uh, up to 2015 when the tax rate was full scale. And it increased until 2017. And after but this peak, actually it is, it started to decline. And we, we, I don't know how the number of the 2020. So that's why I don't have a carbon tax revenue here. But if you look at the coal, uh, petroleum and coal tax, actually it's also peaked around 2017. And because of the successful uh, climate policy or energy efficiency policy, the usage of oil and coal has been declining. So. At the same time, uh, the revenue is also declining over years. So I think some argue that uh, ministry want, Ministry of Economy also wants to have tax revenue because they are using this tax revenue to promote new technologies or energy efficiency or renewables. So it is plausible that these ministries uh, want to introduce carbon tax because they need revenue. But currently, uh, so Minister METI is discussing this unique scheme. So they are calling it uh, Green Transformation League, GX League. So they want to make a kind of a uh, club that companies with ambitious greenhouse gas emission targets can participate in this target and they pledge their emission goals and they deliver emission reductions. They, the METI proposed this because still some energy intensive sectors are against uh, mandatory policies. But at the same time, we see many companies are already uh, pledging their emission target. So they, the, the government, the METI is trying to invite all these companies with a strong emission target. And if they cannot achieve a deliver the reduction, the METI will introduce carbon pricing or man mandatory carbon pricing. And, but the, by joining this, I think they, they will get some kind of uh, benefits from the government. Uh, we don't know yet what kind of form, but METI is also inviting financial sectors to help these companies under this league. So that's what they are trying to uh, introduce now. And another thing that METI is trying to do is creating a big, carbon credit markets. Here, uh, actually inside Japan, we have a credit called J credit. So this is a credit that companies can earn if they invest in the renewable energies or if they invest in the forest management and they can issue the credits. And we also have a credit called joint crediting mechanism. This is uh, similar to the clean development mechanism under Kyoto Protocol, but this is a Japanese government initiative that Japanese government form a uh, two country agreement and invest in the uh, developing countries. And by reducing emissions, government can earn credits 
And this is uh, formally approved under the Paris Agreement. And we also have some other voluntary credits and we have separated uh, this integrated, integrated markets inside of Japan. And METI wants to uh, unify all these different markets and increase the liquidity and send some price signaling of carbon price in, in Japan. So that's what they are trying to start now and hoping that uh, farms participating in GX Week can uh, provide credits or purchasing credits if the government implement this. I'm sorry, so I'm running out of time. But let me uh, briefly discuss how Japanese government wants to achieve the carbon neutrality. I think first thing, just like many countries, electrifications we have to electrify many uh, energy sources. And also we need a hydrogen. And for the electrifications, we need a investment of the electricity grid. As I mentioned, it's, we are, we, our grid is not strong enough to accommodate more renewable energies. And also rechargeable battery is a very uh, big uh, priority. And this is the uh, design of a smart carbon, uh, smart de decarbonized society. And so this is figure shows the path from 2018 to 2050. And here you are seeing that in electricity part, they actually, there is ambiguity how we will achieve uh, carbon neutrality in the 2050, especially role of nuclear. It's not clear how much nuclear power they are aiming in 2050. They just combine nuclear and thermal uh, 30%. And you can see that uh, we are counting on the carbon recycling and hydrogen and ammonia. So I think the government is thinking that, you know, you, we cannot get rid of all the uh, fossil fuel uh, power generations, but by using hydrogen and ammonia, uh, we can reduce emissions. So that's the big, uh, I think, stance. And also, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask to expertise in France that the, the Japanese government gas industries, they are trying to use the metanations. You know, there is no renewable in the gas, <laughs> but to survive the carbon neutrality, they are aiming a methanation. And also uh, plantation and, and DAX. Let's see. And for the meantime, uh, the government is promoting uh, net zero energy buildings basically uh, energy efficiency and also generation of electricity using solar. Uh, by combining this, uh, we can make the, our emission zero from the buildings or also zero emissions from housings. We call it ZEB or ZETCH. The, the government is now trying and some manufacturers come up with some uh, products that can realize this zero emissions and they're trying to promote it. And the other thing uh, is that for the meantime, uh, we are expecting the big offshore winds. So we know that there is a big potential for these five regions for the uh, wind powers. So uh, be, there are uh, big projects are going on these offshore, but not like uh, Europe, uh, Japanese oceans actually gets very uh, steep. And so we are having uh, like a floating offshore wind. So that's the uh, strategy that we are taking now. And in addition, uh, Japanese government is counting on CCUS. Uh, 
so I see that uh, chemical industry used to be against climate policy entirely. But now I see some chemical industries are kind of trying uh, promoting or supporting climate policies because they see that there is maybe some business chance in a carbon neutral world. And the I mean, first thing that we have been discussing is like our carbon capture uh, storage. But in, I mean, I don't, in the US or in Europe, I mean, Norway has been working on the CCS and Japanese power companies and the chemical industries also uh, doing R&D for the CCS. But in addition to that, now they are trying to utilize the CO2 and especially the carbon recycling is getting attention. And they are trying to use it as a chemicals after collecting uh, carbon dioxide and also using it again as a fuels. Another thing is like uh, using CO2 as a minerals, like a concrete products. Actually some uh, construction company is now uh, started to sell uh, concrete uh, for, made from uh, CO2. And also they are counting on the negative sum emission technologies. And again, and also uh, hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, so we, I think the government is not considering to remove all the uh, fossil fuel power plants. So they are trying to use hydrogen and ammonia. <laughs> and then that way they can reduce carbon intensity in the fossil fuel power plants. But the question is how to produce hydrogen. And some companies are considering to produce hydrogen in Australia and import to Japan. And by in importing, actually they are trying to use form of ammonia. So ammonia actually have a lot of uh, roles in carbon neutral world that the Japanese government is uh, considering. The, the another thing that the, I, I already mentioned this is that methanation from the gas industries. I mean, but in the 2050, they want to uh, create a methane uh, from CO2. And so that's their big goal. But in the meantime, actually they are promoting a carbon neutral natural gas by which they means that they actually purchase carbon, I mean, natural gas and sell the natural gas, but they offset their emissions by investing in the forest management in Australia or buying a carbon credits. So that's what they are trying to do now, uh, currently in Japan. Toshi, uh, Toshi for, forgive me to interrupt. Just yep. to, to, to indicate that you, you've been speaking a little bit over 40 minutes. Okay, so I'll you, stop here. We, we need to save time for discussion. So I don't know if you want to say a few words to conclude and then. Yeah, so I want to conclude my presentation. This was actually my last slide. So Japanese sectors and Japanese government have been changed, has have changed to support carbon neutrality. And also the more industries are accepting the carbon pricing now, but the we are counting on the CCUS or hydrogen ammonia. And though I did not have much time, a low cost battery is actually very important part of carbon neutral policy for Japan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very so, much, uh, Professor Aimura. <clears throat> this is a very extremely informative and uh, interesting uh, presentation. I guess we, we already learned a lot about uh, the policies, of course, of this uh, of this uh, carbon neutrality in, in, in Japan, the different uh, alternatives and, and uh, the issues of uh, changing the energy mix. There are also very interesting aspects of, in what you developed in the, on the politics of this uh, dimension mm -hmm. with the lobbying of the different uh, uh, industrial sectors, 
and the relationship between the central and, and local governments, particularly the, the metropolitan, the Tokyo metropolitan government. So very interesting. Thank you very much. We'll move to the discussion. <coughs> um, I'm not sure if it's better to start with Caroline or Patrick. Whatever, Caroline, would be you would you would you be ready to to go? Yes, certainly. So um, go ahead. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Caroline has been one of the architect of the agreement on the Sciences Po side of the, of the agreement between Sciences Po and Waseda, and this, this is thanks to this uh, agreement that we now have uh, Professor Arimura with us today. So, Caroline, thank you. you come and, and please go ahead. I'm very happy to see uh, this result. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, super interesting indeed and enlightening for me uh, presentation. I, obviously, uh, I will. I think Professor Kriki will be uh, the next discussant. Will be more focusing on the um, uh, more technical and energy related issues because this is his field. And I will uh, ask you more questions about the politics that Risha also uh, mentioned. Um, I have actually three sets of questions. I think, I think it was very interesting to see uh, things that are maybe specific to Japan and things that are uh, more uh, common to Japan and Europe. So I will also want to push a little bit towards uh, ways of comparing our you know, uh, respective situations. So um, I have three sets of topic, if you wish, that are both comments and, and questions. The first one is about, uh, indeed, the, the, the non-state actors that you have been talking about and you've been very much involved in the discussion yourself with the Tokyo authorities. Um, there's an interesting thing here that uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, Ishihara Shintaro, the governor, uh, was a, a right wing. And indeed, he has been known back in the 90s for writing a very well-known Japan that can say no pamphlet that was very uh, on the right of the right, and and comparing it to uh, uh, California, I mean Sch Schwarzenegger's California is interest. I mean, there's an interesting take here because, as you know, uh, uh, Schwarzenegger in uh, in California was a champion. You know, uh, positioned himself as a champion of um, climate action and the environment in general, and he was close to the Republicans. I mean, he grew uh, under. Uh, uh, Reagan and supported Bush and uh, and then Donald Trump until Trump got the U.S. out of the Paris uh, Agreement, and now you have this polarization where you know uh, pro environment uh, non state actors and actors in general uh, would be so called on the left, whereas um, you have uh, and and we have that in in you know in the presidential elections in in France and in Europe in general, and obviously in the US very much so. So there's this disconnect that is interesting, I think that, it, you know, Koike, the governor is also uh, very much on the right. So there's a, this disconnect of protecting the environment being not necessarily, you know, liberal or Republican or conservative or, or anything. So, um, but what I would like uh, to ask you is to push a little bit more on, on this action of particularly Tokyo. Is it, uh, what is its reach? I mean, in, in, at the national level and at, at the international level, because when Trump indeed got out of the Paris Agreement, California positioned itself as you know, the one that was going to save the, the agreement in the US and mm -hmm. is, was having, I mean, it went very far in, in saying, you know, we have our own policy. Um, and uh, so what about uh, Tokyo in terms of, you know, outreach and, and trying to make a special statement? Although of course it's not so much at odds now with the national government. And what about at the national level? Because if you, you know, I was, uh, I saw the picture of you in Goto uh, Reto, the, in the, in near Nagasa of Nagasaki and the power plants, and that involves other, you know, Nagasaki and other in the south and in the north in Hokkaido, um, other policies. So, or or just Osaka, another big city. Is there anything that Tokyo is doing apart what you mentioned with uh, the the neighboring prefectures? And what, so, in general, this is my first point about. You know the non-state actors. Maybe you have also things to say about more about the NGOs. 
Second point is about the nuclear issue. So you did mention that, uh, you know, we, the Japan might go from 6% to 21% of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, as you know, it's a very hot topic now in Europe and, and it will be in the, in the French presidential election. You know, what is, you know, nuclear is, is it, you know, is it good for the environment? How good, et cetera. So you didn't, I think Richard mentioned the fact that now the, the Kishida government is actually a bit more pro-nuclear because uh, the, the actual, uh, actually the, the minister of the environment, uh, uh, Mr. Yamaguchi Tsuyoshi is, is known to be pro-nuclear. Uh, but what's your take on that? You said, okay, so how do we go from six to, 21% in terms of politics, as you, we all know, it's a super touchy subject in Japan uh, because of Fukushima, but of course, because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, and, you know, and the long history of, of, of nuclear in Japan. So um, if you could tell, I mean, or give us your take on how are we going to move towards that? I mean, um, because everybody noticed that Mr. Yamaguchi is pro-nuke and was replace, I mean, replace someone who was less uh, in favor of the nuclear. So that's my, that would be um, my second point. And my third point is something um, more uh, generally international or rather regional. Uh, there's an obvious, and I saw that you, you had to go a little bit quickly at the end. And I saw on one of your slides that you were about to say something about Korea and uh, <clears throat> the carbon credit market, and is that, does that involve Korea? Well, anyway, my, my question is, um, those, those issues of uh, regional cooperation, there's of course the big question of China, and of course, Ishan knows more about that than myself, but we know that you know, there's one thing that is to say, okay, Japan is going to reduce um, its uh, uh, carbon emission, but it's another thing to look at how much every, international actor needs to do. And as we know, China is by far, far, far the biggest coal consumer. Um, if you take per capita, I mean, that's on, 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 on the country level. And of course, China is a super big country. So if you look at per capita numbers, of course, China is no longer the, the biggest consumer of, of coal per capita, but it's still very much high in the list. And Japan is definitely, lower in the list. I mean, Japan per capita is, is, is less than, uh, than Germany, the US, China, etc. So uh, it's, I mean, it's an obvious question, you know, how Japan can cooperate with its neighbors, China and Korea on those issues. Uh, and what's, I mean, what I know is that at the ASEAN level, the Southeast Asia level, there's a lot being done between Japan and ASEAN. There's the Asia Energy Transition Initiative. There's a lot of talks, it's completely open. Whereas at the Northeast Asian level with China and Korea, uh, you have a rather mid-level uh, cooperation. I mean, it's the level of the ministers and, uh, and you do have tripartite dialogue, but it's not, it's not like, you know, the, the, the head of states getting together or head of governments getting together. Um, so, of course, no one can uh, read the future, but uh, uh, what we know is that, well, again, if there's one indication is that Kishida's government, and that has been um, making people raise eyebrows, um, has um, a, a foreign minister uh, Hayashi Yoshimasa, who's so-called pro-China. So, uh, I mean, uh, Kishida, the prime minister, made some signal about having a so-called pro-China foreign minister. But we all know that, you know, Japan needs to be in sync with the U.S. Uh, so there's so much Japan can do vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. And, and it's not going to antagonize uh, Biden, Joe Biden's uh, anti-China policy, but it is trying, going to try to do something uh, a little bit different. So it seems to me that you know the environment would be the obvious, uh, uh, and, and 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 carbon neutrality would be the obvious field where they could uh, do something. But I, I mean, again, I don't know how much you're studying this, so that I just would like to have your 
you know, general impression or your take on that. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I reply now before I forget? <laughs> Uh, it's always a, a good bunch of questions, so I think probably this is the best way to proceed. And unless Patrick wants to step in, if if it's really, if you no, no, I think it's good to to have the, okay. the first shot of answers. Okay, so let's let's do that. <coughs> Toshi, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, so first, I uh, thank you for asking. You know, very insightful questions uh, for the. Tokyo's uh, role, uh, I mean, they are trying to cooperate with the international uh, network. So there is like kind of a network with like a Paris or New York or uh, all these big cities. So in that context, they're trying to keep up with these international connections. And in addition, I think Tokyo often try to uh, reach to the other part of the regions but so far they have not been successful in expanding this ETS network. Now they are very busy in aiming 50% carbon half, 50% reduction by 2030. This is the very big agenda. And so they have been working so hard and discussing how we can implement more renewables in Tokyo area. The, but the, regarding a non-state actor, I want to mention that there is an interesting group called JCLP, Japan Climate Leaders Partnership. So this is a group of uh, Japanese companies. They also belong to Japanese Business Federation, Keidan Ren, but JCLP expressed different opinions from Keidan Ren. It's a kind of unique for Japanese history. I mean, most of the big corporations never express their opinion. Only Keidan express opinions. But this new movement by JCLP is actually, they express the support for climate policy or carbon pricing, which is very different from Keidan Ren. And so I, we see that there are some kind of changes in the power or role of the Keidan Ren in the Japanese business community. Second about nuclear. So this, so the officially government says we will aim 21% by 2030. That's their public announcement. In privately, I heard that some people saying, well, we are lucky if we get to 10%. <laughs> you know, in reality, I mean, the, LDP has strong tie with nuclear industry, so they have to show the big numbers. <laughs> but they know, the government knows that it's very difficult to convince local people. It's, 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 it is the local people that uh, now have very strong allergy toward nuclear. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I guess, sorry, sorry, just to uh, jump in, but it, I guess it changes. I mean, if you're in the Sendai area, uh, because you're close to Fukushima, maybe people are more sensitive than if they're in Okinawa or in Okinawa. You know, is there any difference, regional difference? Because you said local people. I mean, so anywhere, if you are trying to build a nuclear or run the nuclear, I mean, local peoples uh, feel uneasy yeah. about yeah in general um, but not not in particular in one place or another like tokyo people are as much allergic to nuclear as as let's say i think it's kind of uniform across yeah. japan yeah yeah no but i mean it's so it's so far more touchy than any country in the world so any other country in the world there's no experience of <clears> uh, <throat> Sorry, and I, I... And regarding the international cooperations about Korea and China, uh, so far, I don't know uh, any very specific cooperation with China, but the Chinese government uh, interested in expanding the uh, emission trading scheme and linking to Korea and Japan. So I have been participating in this dialogue from 2016. So every year they are discussing how we can link the markets, but we have nothing to link to <laughs> China and Korea. And in addition, I wanna say that 
environment is always a very good venue for cooperation between countries. Even when we have a very difficult uh, relationship with China, government is trying to promote uh, cooperation in the field of environment. And yeah, I guess yeah, that's the kind of the role of the China, but so far I haven't heard about any specific initiative by Prime Minister, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi. I have met him once 15 years ago, <laughs> you know, in event. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Well, it's early days maybe from Mr. Hayashi and, uh, you know, we might see some, I think we might see some change in, I mean, if the, the Kishida government stays as it is, we might see some change, but not right away. Uh, but what, what I see is interesting about GC, G, JCLP is that, and this is also something you, about, you said, I mean, that comes out of this uh, initiative of the voluntary credit market is that the, the traditional lobbies of Japan, like Keidan Man and, and, and big um, industrial lobbies, are, you know, the, the, the lines are being shifted a bit because of the carbon policy that you see. I mean, the JCLP is super interesting in that regard that you see shifting lines of, of power. I mean, not major earthquake, but still something shifting. Yes. So, I mean, it used to be that power sector and steel sectors kind of uh, representing all these discussion on the climate policy. But we now see the other sectors are also vocal on climate policy. And sometimes, I mean, JCLP is supporting <coughs> climate policy. <coughs> I think this is a big influence of ESG investment and TCFD. And to survive in the global business, they have to do be uh, pro-climate. And mm. okay. okay, very very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Let, let's move to well, thank you very much, Professor Arimura, for this uh, highly comprehensive and detailed uh, presentation of the uh, climate policy in Japan. I, I learned quite a lot with this uh, presentation. And, and thank you to Caroline. To some extent, my points are, are similar or parallel to those pointed by, by Caroline. I had uh, quite a lot of, uh, of remarks. I tried to organize them in three main areas or three main issues, which indeed correspond to those of Caroline. Uh, the, the first one is the, the question of the strategy and more exactly, how is the Japanese strategy produced and, and developed among the different stakeholders? Uh, I think this is quite an important uh, issue, as you already mentioned, the fact that, for instance, the industrial lobbies uh, uh, and the different ministries uh, develop different views on, on what sh should be a, a climate policy for Japan. Uh, uh, to some extent, I may mention an experience we had in France almost 10 years ago now, uh, in the so-called national debates, national debate on energy transition, in which there has been a, a national council that has been invited to work on the definition of the uh, future climate strategy in France. And there were in this council representations of the NGOs, environmental NGOs, consumer association, trade unions, uh, business association, uh, the parliament, the local authorities, and so on. And it was quite an interesting experience uh, to, to live. I was an expert in this, in this process. And uh, uh, I think that in this context, we, we succeeded in defining archetypes, four, four archetypes scenarios. One scenario was based more on sufficiency, what we call in French sobriété, sufficiency in English, I think. Uh, one was based more on efficiency. The third one was a balanced picture uh, using the different solutions, either to reduce demand or to decarbonize supply. And the last scenario 
was a, a strongly nuclear scenario, to some extent, the reproduction of the current, current French energy system. What is interesting in this experience is the fact that if you take these scenarios and put it in the current context of the presidential election in France, you can find that it remains highly, uh, it, it has a strong descriptive power of the different possibilities for the French energy system. So my question based on this experience on the strategy building is, is there in Japan something similar that could allow the different stakeholders of different nature to exchange and discuss on the contrasted possible strategies to be adopted in, in Japan? This is my, my first point. My second point goes to the uh, technological solutions. Of course, there, this is a, a very important issue. And um, a set of questions can be raised uh, addressing the, the problem of energy demand and energy consumption. My question is, to what extent Japan is a country with a very well-developed industry on uh, information technology? And my question is to what extent the deployment of information technologies can help in the so-called smart energy systems, smart buildings, smart grids. To what extent do you think that uh, IT can help in reducing demand? This is for demand. As, as far as supply is concerned, of course, we have already touched the question of nuclear energy. <laughs> My question is, uh, do you think that small modular reactors, uh, small nuclear reactors that are today considered as a potential option in France with different forms of uh, SMLs, small modular reactors, do you think this might be an option in Japan? And do you think it may change this? I don't know at all. Might it change the uh, position of the population, we have mentioned this problem, uh, as regards nuclear energy. And uh, also on this question of the technology, you mentioned methanation. Uh, yeah. uh, this is a way to use uh, green hydrogen and produce uh, the equivalent of methane through green hydrogen. Um, yeah. my, my view for the moment is that uh, uh, at least in France, this option might be overestimated. Uh, and I would believe more in the, in the direct use of hydrogen, for instance, in gas turbines. It, I think it is possible to use hydrogen in gas turbines uh, in order to produce, uh, um, to produce uh, um, uh, electricity that, that you can activate on demand, which is not the case of uh, solar and, and wind, wind energy. So this is a, this is a point. And finally, my, my last point is not on the solutions, but on the incentives. You, you have described in detail the, the different options which are available, either emission trading systems or carbon tax. You have mentioned the fact that uh, for the moment, the carbon tax, which is considered, is indeed very, very low. In my understanding, this is more a financing carbon tax than an incitative uh, carbon tax, which, which would be the so-called Pigouvian perspective uh, of the economists on, on a ta carbon tax, the tax that is used in order to uh, penalize, or, or yes, to, to, yes, to penalize the, the consumption of fossil mm. fuels. What you mentioned was, uh, in, from my understanding, a uh, uh, financing carbon tax in order to, to finance uh, efficiency and, and renewable. Mm. And, uh, but I think that there are many, and in Europe currently, in Europe currently, there are a lot of, maybe not a lot of discussion, but a lot of underlying problems in the so-called fit for 55 uh, perspectives of the European Commission in uh, uh, combining 
an extension of the emission trading system to the building and transport sector, and the connection with existing carbon taxes. In my view, this is not clear at all. How will this connection uh, act in Europe? But from what I understand in Japan, you may have the same problem. How to, uh, uh, how <laughs> to um, manage in a consistent way the coexistence between emission trading systems mm -hmm. and carbon tax? And my last point finally will be a, a question on uh, uh, the so-called border carbon adjustment mechanisms. Uh, this is a question which is discussed in Europe currently and which will probably be, uh, be pushed by the French presidency of the European Union. This is considered as a way to avoid the carbon leakages you have mentioned. And uh, I would like to know if there is some thinking in Japan on uh, this type of mechanisms, and even maybe why not uh, 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 coordination between uh, Europe and Japan on this question of uh, border carbon adjustment mechanisms. So thank you again. I think we, we have a lot to gain in, uh, in uh, exchanging on the experiences in the different regions and a better understanding of the problems. We have more problems than solutions uh, from both sides, I, I think, but uh, exchanging on problems and solutions might help in the definition of the strategies. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I know I have a question from Bernard. So Bernard, do you want to raise your, your point now or, or later? Is it related to later? Okay, so please, Professor Arimora, I think you can take this <laughs> very substantial uh, set of questions and, and give us your, your take on these different issues, please. Okay, thank you. A first question about the different stakeholders. Uh, actually, like in the uh, Carbon Pricing Committee and the Environmental Council for the government, we have a representative of NGO, but it's not, uh, yeah, so that's the kind of place where they can express their ideas. But uh, the other thing is that a lot of policy that I mentioned, like a CCUS or hydrogen, it is developed uh, based on the bottom-up approach. So industrial associations working together with Ministry of Economy and come up with realistic planning. So that's a very typical uh, involvement of the business sectors. Uh, but yeah, I, there are some other channels, but I don't see uh, that big discussion that you explained in France uh, in the Japanese style. We had such a discussion a lot after the earthquake, how we view the nuclear, how we, should accommodate nuclear power in our society. And there was a lot of dialogue between the government and power sectors and civil society. But not much for the carbon neutrality yet. The second about the technology solutions. For the energy demand control, we are using, I mean, a lot, we, are, we see many uh, startups, companies that make use of ITC uh, for promoting you know, demand control. But the, the other thing that I noticed that in the, the revision of the energy saving law, uh, the government is trying to promote the changes in the electric appliances so that lots of you know, rechargeable appliances can charge the electricity during the daytime when we have a lot of sunshine. <laughs> so that I think the get kind of use of ITCs, but yeah, and also in the controlling grid systems, I think ITC plays a very important role. So we have to make use of it. But uh, overall, we are feeling that actually Japan is not doing uh, the digitalizations. We are not so good at uh, implementing the, you know, uh, 
the fight fight against the COVID nineteen. <laughs> So we're trying to uh, brush up the digitalization again. So that's the situation. And small module reactor, which is getting some attention, especially among the Japanese politicians. So they are considering this is a maybe real good options for the Japanese uh, nuclear power uh, industries. But we haven't had a discussion I mean, I think the discussion did not has not reached to the you know uh, general public yet, but newspapers and politicians are now discussing it. Are, are there any industrial projects in this field? I don't know. I don't know about this yet, but it's certainly getting attention. And. And thank you for your comment on the meta nations. Yeah, I, I, that was very uh, useful for me. Mm -hmm. And regarding the incentives, consistency, and that is actually has been a very big point. I think if when the, as you mentioned that carbon tax in the Japanese system is more of the financing incentive rather than pricing incentive. And, but now they are trying to increase the price of the carbon tax. But I think some people or industry arguing that we already have other policies in place. So we have to consider the effective carbon rate. What, we, what are the real policies that each industry is, is facing? Some may argue that we are already having under this policy. Others may argue that we are already are facing some mandates from transportation sectors. Why are we having additional tax? So that's, I think, the next step that we have to work on if the Ministry of the Environment is increasing uh, carbon tax. And finally, CBAN is really, really getting uh, big attention. Actually, I'm, I'm doing a project for CBAN. <laughs> and Japanese industries are keen on the influence of the CBAM on steel sectors uh, and maybe possibly on the chemical industries. It, it's not that Japan is exporting steel a lot to European Union, but the China is exporting a lot, right? Mm -hmm. If the EU implements CBAM, Chinese exports maybe shift from Europe to Southeast Asia, where Japanese industry may compete <laughs> against Chinese industries. <clears throat> this is a big concern for the Japanese industries. I think I covered um, many of the questions. From yeah, you. thank you very much. Thank you very all, much. All of the questions. Oh, thank you, very much. <clears throat> Bernard? Yes, dear um, uh, Toshi, this is a, a question coming from um, a philosophical or, and political science background perspective. Two brief questions. The first question is, where is the place of the public and the consumers in all uh, the transition, the ecological transition you have to uh, move? Um, are they more breakers or are they pushers and promoters of that? You compare it with, with France, we have both. And um, you've heard perhaps about the Yellow Vest crisis we had, and, and yeah. after that, the convention for the, the citizen convention <laughs> for the climate. And the second is uh, as you have been an expert pleading in front of decision makers, you said, it was in the beginning of your expose, that you have been unsuccessful in your presentation, you have not been heard. <laughs> Why? Is it a question of the understanding of expertise, the economical side, the environmental side, or is it only a kind of political game or something else? If you have any ideas about this, uh, the, the, the question behind that is the connections between expertise and decision making. Thank you for very deep questions. First about the uh, role of the consumers. I, I think people have not realized 
how these carbon neutral policy affect consumers' life yet. Okay. <laughs> if, if they learn that they uh, will face a very high electricity price or high gas price, they will be very vocal. <laughs> I was actually 10 years ago when the, minister, the government reduced the price of the highway road, I did economic analysis and I actually my research was published in newspaper. And my, my study showed that the lowering the price is not good for the environment. Then a lot of drivers actually criticized me. Why are you stopping the policy that helping consumers? <laughs> so I see. Yeah. So, so I mean, so we can we can see we will see some kind of yellow vest movement. Yeah, Japanese in front of you. <laughs> and after that, you can you can learn from us. <laughs> the second, I think a lot of discussion that experts are doing in front of politicians or government sector is kind of trying to move things forward, but a lot of discussion are done behind the scene. Okay, you know, I see. As I mentioned that there lots of discussion, 10 years ago, there was a lot of discussion of ETS and nothing on the carbon tax, but all of a sudden they decided to introduce carbon tax. <laughs> I see. So, yeah, say, that, thank that's, you. that's my understanding. Thank you very much. Do, do we have any further questions? Okay. I have one on my side, but uh, I'm happy to take any, any question from the audience. I see one. Carola, please. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, the public opinion that Bernard also just asked about, and particularly also civil society. I mean, from the from what you just said, I understand that basically the the general public isn't yet aware of the implications of that policy change. What about NGOs or civil society, and particularly sort of more radical movements like uh, Extinction Rebellion? Is there anything like that in Japan? Thank you. Okay, I, I'm sorry that I didn't discuss that. But the NGOs are playing an important role, like uh, WWF Japan is a, a key player to promoting uh, climate policy. And uh, typically the representative from WWF Japan is participating as a member of a, a council for the environment. And also there's a more radical NGO like a climate network, which uh, actually has been done a lot of lawsuits against coal power plants, so they are fighting <laughs> in these areas. And in addition, uh, we see uh, younger generations uh, movement by younger generations. I mean, maybe as not much as a uh, European case, but some young people are vocal on SDGs issues, including climate policies, and they are trying to move climate policy forward. So that's when I think the, especially in the past few years, I see more active uh, involvement of these players in the climate policy discussions. Okay. Do, do we have, uh, Professor Aymoura, Toshi, do we have a, a specific measure about the, because you, you, you said the, the public opinion is not very aware of the, of the, the, the cost of electricity and the, the cost of power. So does it mean that electricity is cheap in Japan? And, and do, do we have a no, 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 kind no, of no. measurement to assess this in comparison to we, other we, we have competitors? Or? The power price has been increasing over year and year and because of the shutdown of the nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And besides, you know, because lots of criticism on coal power plants and also negative, you know, future or prediction of the uh, fossil fuel plants, 
Japanese power companies kind of stopped investing in fossil fuel. So, especially in the winter, just like in you know what we see in Spain or other parts of Europe, we are seeing a very high price of electricity. So people are kind of upset uh, uh, or from watching this high price that they are facing in the winter time. Mm -hmm. But so they're not still paying attention to the consequences of climate policy <laughs> yet. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Well, my, my, my question was about uh, what was in, I would like to understand more, more precisely, I think, the, the role of uh, Japanese industry and uh, of lobbying activity with regard to this, uh, to this policy. I, I thought it was very striking in your presentation that Japan, despite being a centralized, a relatively centralized government and having close connection with the industry, failed to impose an ETS system, <laughs> an emission trading system to the whole uh, country. So I guess, uh, according to what you said, this is because of the resistance of the industry, <clears throat> but which kind of industry is part more particularly resisting to that? Uh, power, electric power industry and steel sector. Both of them. Yeah, both of them were very vocally against the ETS. And these two, two players are the kind of representing the energy issues under Japanese Business Federation. I so we, we, we did not hear the voices from other sectors until recently. Okay, and, and do they have a, a, a choosing between a, a tax and a, and a trading system? Do they, do they have a preference? Do they prefer some of these instruments rather than the other? Or? No, I mean, they no. typically say that no, neither of them is good for our business. <laughs> <laughs> neither of them is good for business. Okay. okay. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to ask uh, Patrick if he knows if uh, this is exactly the same in France uh, and in Europe or, or if other differences. Do, do we see sometimes the utilities accepting and sometimes claiming for an ETS system, for instance? Well, they have already accepted since quite a long time ago now. Uh, and so I think that indeed that they are in this system. The, the main debate regarding the ETS system in Europe is the fact that up to now, uh, a series of industries and namely the cement and the, and the steel industries had free quotas. And uh, now the question is how to go from the free quotas to uh, auction uh, provided quotas. And this is, this is part of the discussion. Of course, in the past years, there has been quite a lot of, it was not frontal opposition of steel and cement industries in, in Europe. It was, a, a, I don't know how to say that, but a, a soft opposition and trying indeed to to, to, for instance, to keep this system of free, free allowances of uh, emission quotas. Uh, but uh, so no, by and large, there is, a, there, there is an acceptation of this uh, system, better than a tax in, in any case, better than a tax okay. for industries. Okay, thank you very much. Any other point or questions or comments? No, if not, uh, well, we will have to thank uh, Toshi, Professor Harimura, and our two, two discussants. Thank you. Thank you really for this very interesting and uh, very interesting presentation. I hope we have other opportunities to, because it's very informative and, and you know, this is a discussion we will need to have for a long, quite a long time, I guess. And, and the comparison is uh, very enlightening and, and very, very, very interesting. So thank you for taking the time for join, joining us. We hope to see you, Toshi, in, in Paris uh, at one point. 
uh, maybe in Japan, if we are able to travel more easily in, in, in the future. And in, in any case, we, we hope to stay in touch and to, to develop this, yeah. uh, this collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice Thank day. Bye. 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 Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.